So today is Friday, September the 20th. This is the W3C Web Registry Working Group. And as usual, we abide by the W3C patent policy. And only people and companies listed on this link are allowed to make substantive contributions. Uh, so today's Friday, which means we're trying to make progress on the future of the Web Registry Working Group. That includes things like rechartering the working group and looking at any use cases and extensions and other things that are a little bit more forward thinking than we did yesterday. So this is what we've got on our schedule uh, between now and 9.15. Uh, Florian and I will be talking about scalable video coding extension and then from 9.15 to 10 a.m. we have privacy issues which uh, UN will lead and we'll have ping, people from the ping working group will be coming. I'm told quite a few of them. <laughs> um, and then uh, we get to talk about NV use cases for a half an hour. Uh, and then we'll get into the recharter um, and we'll have lunch. And after lunch, we have a meeting, joint meeting with the Accessibility Platform Architectures Working Group, who have sent us an accessibility use cases document, which you may want to look at. Um, so we'll be talking about that. And then we'll go back <laughs> to stats. More exciting stats with Boone and Henrik. Um, and um, we have a session that currently has, I think, TBD, although I'm not sure we may have uh, decided things to talk about during that session. And then Harold will wrap up uh, starting at 4.30. Any other, any comments on this agenda? Harold? If we don't have any TBD, we can wrap up earlier. Right. Do you think the NV use cases would be 30 minutes enough? What? Do you think 30 minutes would be enough for the NV use cases? Well, I think, let me put it this way. I only have half an hour uh, worth of things prepared. Okay. Um, and uh, basically, I'm just relying on whatever PRs we had in there. A bunch of people, people have been filing issues, but they haven't been filing PRs. So it's like, you know, if they have a problem with no solution, I don't know if it's worth our time. But uh, yeah, I mean, if um, if anybody here has things they specifically want us to talk about in these cases, if you can go ahead and create a PR, then we can talk about it. But I, I only have basically one PR at the moment, um, which relates to security. Okay, so now we're talking about scalability video coding extension for WebRTC. I have about 45 minutes for that, and a couple of PRs and, uh, and issues uh, to go into. Uh, the first PR uh, is uh, more or less a maintenance issue, and that is that the current spec has a scalability mode table in section six, as well as prediction structure diagrams that are in the appendix B. Um, now, formally, the scalability mode table was a, at one point, it was a subset of all of the AB1 modes. We uh, initially took out the S modes um, because uh, in IETF simulcast, you send the simulcast only on separate streams. Um, but then it was pointed out that there actually might be some use for sending simulcast on a single stream with a single encoding, so they were put back in. Um, and the diagrams are also uh, based on, and in some cases, copied from the AV1 bit stream spec. In section six seven five. So uh, there's a couple of concerns from this. If the table is basically the same one as in the AV1 spec, um, it means that we have to update our spec whenever AV1 adds new modes and diagrams, and they've been doing that on a fairly continuous basis. So that's, um, I mean, that's just adding stuff to a table, so maybe not that bad. But then they draw the pictures, and they join the pictures in PNG format, and that means I have to go and create this, recreate the same pictures in SVG format and they've been getting more and more complicated. Um, so there's a question of how much value that has to people to have, for example, all of these SVG diagrams in the spec as opposed to just referring them to the AV1 spec which has the same, same diagrams. So the proposed solution in PR13 is just to remove the appendix with the pictures um, and just reference the AV1 spec for the actual diagrams. Uh, but keep the table? Keep the table. All right. Um, so we, we basically get, yeah, we keep the table, uh, but remove remove the diagrams. 
Does anybody? Uh, sounds good to me. You can have a link for so, tables. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good, good. So, is a table normative or informative? Well, that's a good question. Um, it doesn't, in the spec, it's not required that any implementation implement any particular set of modes, but it is normative in the sense that it describes the DOM stream that you use to initiate the modes. Yeah, that's, that's what I was wondering about, because if it just says that this is a copy of the real modes, which are over here, it's in and you say that uh, it, that if a new string that you haven't seen both stuff, you have to go to the AV1 right. spec to, to do it. And, and the AV1 spec doesn't define DOM strings for them. It's actually a number from the zero to three, and I don't think we want to probably use that. Yeah. So so that so that means that uh, the, the table is normative for the values of the strings. Right. And, and uh, if you want a new mode. You have to update the document with the new string before right. you can use the new string. Right. Just make it, just make it clear. Right? Okay. Um, but there's no objection to removing all of the pictures. Um, the no. same pictures, <laughs> or or if they're different pictures, it's my error, and their our pictures are wrong, and they're the right. So, so that so, so, so if the other thing is normally for the pictures, the only reason to have a picture is to, to give an illustration of what the picture looks like. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this sounds like uh, actually we should talk about scribing um, to get this decision written down. Accept PR PR fifteen. Okay. Is, is anyone scribing? Uh, I don't think we are right now, but I, I think we want to. I agree. <laughs> I can. Uh, I guess that you tried to describe it. Okay, we have a strike. Okay, no, no. You just agreed to it. How are you? I said, uh, I'm, I'm, am I there at this? Who was the last one that came in the room? And it was you. <laughs> okay. So, this is issue three relating to custom scalability structures. Um, currently, the WebRTC SVC specification only supports discovery and configuration of what we call pre cans SPC scalability modes. Um, and as we said, we took those from AV1 section 675. Um, and it's both pre can SVC modes as well as the S modes, which are the simulcast on a single SSRC with without RITS. Um, we do not currently support configuration of custom scalability structures. So if you want something that's not described in any of those modes, you, you can do it. Um, and so the question came up like, why would you need something that's not there? Really, um, the major reason you would is because these SVC modes have fixed scaling ratios. That is, that they support ratios for spatial um, scalability of 2 to 1 or 1.5 to 1. Um, and historically, the reasons they do that actually the reason they do that is because of this. So if you look at common resolutions, like 16 by 9 aspect ratio and 4 by 3, typically things have, uh, they're either 2 to 1 or 1.5 to 1 ratios between the, between the, uh, the common resolutions. Right? So they're really, um, this actually does cover the vast majority of cases. Um, the only thing that's a little bit weird is if you have wanted to have say three simulcast streams, uh, say 1920 by 1080, 1280 by 720, and 640 by 360, the the ratios are 1.5 and 2 to 1, but they're not consistent between the layers. Um, so, uh, but when we, but then it's been pointed out, yeah, you could just create a new scalability mode that had you know middle layer 1.5 to 1, and then a 2 to 1 for the lowest one. So. It's not, in practice, um, the number of things you actually want to do are, are pretty restricted in the, in the SVC space. Um, which actually brings up the question of why we had to have, uh, you know, scale, uh, scale down by at any infinite, at any value at all, um, when in practice probably wasn't, it wasn't needed to be that, uh, that variable. Um, so, 
Uh, and these are all the modes uh, that we have currently. Um, it, although the, the numbers aren't there, but basically if you look at the L1, T2, whatever, these, these DOM strings are the modes that we have defined in the current spec. The only thing we don't define is this SS, which in AB1 means custom scalability structure. So um, based on this, my recommendation is that we don't actually need custom scalability structures. Um, it's it's um, the modes pretty much cover every configuration, and if we to fix that that issue of, of additional things you might want to do, you could just add more modes, um, and and we don't need to allow you to define basically any any ratio. And this will come up in the um, PR that uh, Farn will be discussing as well. So uh, when when you say you can just add more modes, that means that you would have to get a AO media to define a new yes. number. Um, uh, yes, a, basically um, you would, uh, well, we, we could define it ourselves, but basically you'd want to have, if you wanted to support that in AV1, you would have to get AV media, AO media to agree. Can um, we use the custom scalability to define our own? Well, that was, that's what this issue was, is to say, yes, you could have a, if you, if you were to uh, create a new DOM string called SS or some equivalent to do our own custom thing, Yes, I mean, if we if we but define our own enum value means like 1.75, couldn't we say that what, our, our main up one means the same as SS with these parameters? Yes, you could do that as well. So you don't need these two. Talk yeah, you don't need any one. Basically, they wouldn't have to allocate a code point for that mode because as long as the thing you want to do is describable in their scale, Scalability metadata format, you could do that as well. Yes, yeah, so we're completely free to do it. Yeah, you're completely free to do whatever you want anyway. Um, yeah, so I guess my point is, uh, point of this is, I think we should, my recommendation is we should close this issue um, because we don't actually need the, uh, um, we can just add to the mode table and uh, don't really need a, to, we don't need to find a language in which you have custom scalability structures. Among other things, it's, it's turned out that uh, it's a complicated thing to do anyway, to be able to describe, to, to create a, a language to describe all of these structures. And uh, at least in AME, we haven't been that successful in, in being able to describe all of them anyway. So probably not something we, we want to take on here. So any objections to closing this is not needed. So, the, so just to make it uh, obvious to me, uh, the, the proposal is that we do not define a JavaScript syntax for right. describing a, a custom scalability mode. Correct. Right. But we leave it open that we could use the custom scalability mode function to define. Uh, you can add new DOM strings to the table. Yeah. And you can, uh, you could add, we can add, always add new DOM strings to the table. And then, um, and then instead of referencing an integer from AV1, it would reference a particular SS value. <laughs> well, no, you would you would basically have to describe. You would then go into this spec. You would describe the mode. If it, you could either go to AV1 and tell them to allocate a mode, and if they said yes, that would be fine. It would just be like the other modes in the mode table. If you didn't want to do that, you basically have to describe um, the mode well enough to to make it clear, like. I will, this one mode is a, is a ratio of 1.5 to 1 here and 2 to 1 there. And as long as you describe that in the spec, um, that would be that would be good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you write that all down, Harold, in minutes. But, uh, um, basically, you don't need a JavaScript language for describing the modes. Um, if what I described, if, if all you were doing was changing the scalability ratio, you would say something like, it's exactly like S3P1, except the ratio, instead of being 2 to 1 and 1.5 throughout, it's 1.5 here and 2 there. Right? And that would be pretty much uh, enough to describe it. I would say that if no one comes with a strong use case to actually do that, uh, we should probably leave it as an option in the future. But uh, right now, to not do anything like that. Yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't recommend probably. doing that because it would basically mean that the AO media people would say, we don't think that makes any sense, and probably it would be better to listen to them if they told us that than go off and do it ourselves. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so we, will you be writing a paragraph that says, here's how you 
Here's the procedure for adding adding a new. Yeah, that's I think that's procedure. that's what is needed is basically something of how to extend this load table. Um, yeah, what do you have to do? Yeah, that's actually a great question, Harold, because uh, presumably, yeah, I mean, in the ITF reports, we have an IANA table. Um, right here, like in the WGC, if a working group decides to propose or something, is that there is no projection for the information of the WGC? Oh, okay. And in the project itself, so. From the recording of action to the NUD, the other player has to take it to the development of the to add in new values to the Nice. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the right thing to do because that would probably encourage users to follow the very specific. That's true. Every time they want to try something new, oh, please, can you make a new version of that? Right. With my new just a look. Um, very good. Well, yeah. The question is who is we? We're not around. Are you something going to a registry again? Whatever, it's probably easier than to have a paragraph about like that. If we want to have uh, few nodes, we can open an issue just like I would say, oh, I need a future. Um, and then we can discuss it there rather than read a paragraph that says, oh, if you have something just in mind, yeah, well, we'll find you a comment in the time. Thank you, notes. That is going to be yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We have anchoring parameters right now for some of us layers. There's a list of parameters that some of you know, like scalers that you can buy uh, to change the scaling of the layer. You have um, an active Boolean flag to enable or disable the layer. You have max prime rate, um, changes of prime rate of the layer. Uh, those are very useful for doing simulcast. You usually have also separate encoders, so it, it makes sense there. Uh, but you, when going for SVC, if you are trying to do um, regular SVC or simulcast over SVC, you have currently no control surface to actually tweak the encoding parameters for the special layers. So I believe that's something that we should probably fix and uh, add some encoding parameters to control the encoding of special layers uh, in SVC modes. And there's a few different uh, proposals. Um, right now, um, I think the two parameters that make sense and that are probably not controversial are um, active like to disable or enable um, uh, SVC, SVC special layer, which has some implication if there's dependencies between layers. If you disable one that has dependency on, what happens to the others? That's something that would need to be defined. Uh, and you would have also uh, something easier to discuss, which would be uh, max bitrate for each special layer. So you can have your own bitrate allocation. Um, so, uh, yeah, I believe that's the two most important features that we would probably want to have. Another one that could be interesting as well would be to, uh, to uh, activate or deactivate temporal layers as well for each special layer, which could be used also as well um, if you don't have any, if you have a single special layer and you just have currently two or three uh, temporal layers, you could also probably do that. So, something that we don't have as a goal of this proposal, uh, as we can emphasize, is that we don't want to change the aspect ratio. I wrote about it in the issue, but 
quickly backtrack because it's probably uh, not something we want that would be a custom scalability structure. Uh, but it's probably not desirable. And we don't want to have a max frame rate right now. It could be something that could uh, be discussed later, but how to implement that is a bit complex. So maybe leave it out for now. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, I guess one other thing to say is we don't necessarily believe we have to have exact feature parity of the S mode simulcast yes. with the normal simulcast. Um, so <coughs> like in the normal, but the existing leverage C simulcast, you can scale, frame, you have max frame rate and max rate rate and active and scale resolution down by. We don't feel that you need equivalent functionality in the S mode, even though it's also simulcast. So, also, I think uh, max frame rate was a feature at risk. I it is a feature. We had a typo on the slide yesterday, so we didn't actually cover it. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, but we do really want to implement it in Chrome. Um, yeah. So that's something that is complex to implement, but we are working on it. So, uh, so, you, so you put an arm into the table? Yes, at least one arm. Which will probably ripple to other browsers as it's implemented with what people are not discussing about. So, so, what's exactly the use case for active browsers? Um, so, we, we, we set the SVC profile that says, hey, I want three temporal layers and uh, two special layers. Um, and then with active, we say, oh, I don't want to be this particular one. So, basically, the encoder will. And the stuff and it's the packetizer. I would, I would guess that would uh, not do anything with uh, uh, the data for a few different layer. Or so, um, yeah, that one is a little for the temporal, it's a little tricky because there's dependency. So, yeah. uh, you can't just inactivate the middle one for sure right? because right. The, the it'll depend. So, I think we did talk about this one, yes. and we basically said, you know, if you do try to poke the middle one, it's going to imply that you've been activated everything that depends on it as yeah. well. So, so, so let's say you have like two, uh, two temporal layers. Right. Um, yeah, to inactivate the base, you've gotten rid of both of them and you're saying nothing. Sure. <laughs> sure. But let's say you, you, you remove the top one. Uh, right. You can actually implement that with uh, no SVC and just uh, specify maybe a primary or something like that because you, you just have a, like one layer. So can we just use the... <laughs> The mode, uh, the mode as uh, an implicit way of saying everything is active. So, where, what are the use cases where you specify mode and you actually want to remove one layer? Can you just use so mode that is closer to the use? Well, uh, the answer is it not quite because, uh, as an example, when you remove a spatial layer, right? Your uh, uh, when you inactivate a spatial layer, it's not the same thing as changing the mode to as an example, say uh, uh, L3T1, which is three spatial layers. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, L3T1 has a two to one ratio between the layers, right? Yeah. Now, so from the point of view, if, you, if you're saying, say I want to drop the top one, mm -hmm. it is not the case that dropping the top one is the same thing as moving to L2T1. Well, you, you could define an L2T1 this, but it would do exactly what you want. Uh, yes, but that would be adding modes. Yeah. Um, and you'd have to add a lot of different modes with different scaling ratios to get the same effect. And wouldn't you need to renegotiate and reinstantiate? Well, so the way we've done this spec, there's no, there's never any STP negotiation at all because we're assuming it's just up to the encoder to make a decision what to send. So you wouldn't have to do that. The other concern, uh, UN, is when you're changing modes, there is actually a formal difference between uh, sending, and we've actually gotten into the discussion this with respect to everyone. There's a difference between dropping a layer and keeping the mode the same and changing the mode. Um, and it turns out that at the RTP layer, you can drop a layer, but if you want to change modes, you have to do that in the bitstream itself to have a new scalability metadata. Um, and so there's some amount of, uh, Complexity, you probably, as an example, you probably couldn't. Um, this is, I, I mean, uh, you'd have to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it would be more complex to change the scalability, but you couldn't do that at an arbitrary point in time. 
So you might have to wait, for example, till a keyframe to do it. So, but dropping, you know, is, is a simpler thing I think to do, especially if you're going to turn it back on again. You know, it might come back or something. Um, that might just require an indication in the in the uh, in the RTP packet that yeah, this layer is missing. And I haven't. You don't even necessarily change the bitstream. So yeah, as anyway, as for the, the use case uh, of deactivating, I guess it's, it's for when you want to do it temporarily, like right, like, temporarily. Like uh, oh, I'm I'm a small fundamental, so I'm only sending small version, but on the fly, I'll just start sending it. I resolution yeah. 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 I think the emphasis right now is more on the spatial layer than the temporal layers. Right, right. So um, there are use cases where, in, for example, simulcast modes, where you would want to to have three spatial layers and disable right. the middle one. So you have something smaller but acts like the thumbnail and the full resolution one, uh, for example, for screen share or. Yeah. Although in the case of SVC, right, that would create a complexity because the, the top one would depend on the middle one. So if you no, say, in the simulcast S mode. In, in, right, in simulcast, you can always do that. You can disable the middle one. Yeah. Simulcast is just yeah. not the yeah. that's, 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 that's the second picture, yeah. So in, in terms of use case, yeah. In, in terms of uh, API, it's like you can use active, but not like simulcast. And if you're doing, if you do not understand specifically the mode, then we will scroll an error, we will do some, no. we will we'll just in the way. We'll, so we'll do, we some, we'll do something that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, a, so a, I think it would be easier to go over the next slides yeah. and then okay. show yeah. what we are proposing so we can talk about that. Sure. sure. Um, can I get yeah, sure. So I, I think I, uh, I think it would be a problem for users who don't necessarily understand codex and what SVC is and what, you know, they, they know that this codex is better than this codex. So now, of, uh, you know, a very good SVC codec comes out, they want to switch to that one. Your implementation assumes that when you deactivate the middle layer, it only deactivates that one. And you're not also deactivating implicitly the, the higher or lower, whichever you're looking at. So having that change would, would actually break them. So I think consistency there would be would be more important than, um, I mean, than understanding the, 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 the code, the, the, forcing the user to understand the specific codec. Um, so if you use a codec that you don't understand and more that you don't understand, I think you're well left uh, the creek without the paddle, no matter what. And mm -hmm. there's no, yeah. nothing you can develop to understand how these codecs work and how the encoding works. Well, I think I mean, they, they, then, they should, then they should not touch. Well, yeah. I, I, I think it's like an optimization search. Sure. Um, well, we'll see the solution. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, SVC is an expert feature. Um, so, if you're not an expert and using it, yeah, but you it might expensive. run into issues, and that's probably expected. And and even if you are an expert, you probably don't. <laughs> also, <laughs> probably yes. I think as we, as we see, only really becomes um, interesting if you are an SFU you know, in the path. Anyway. So, most of the people will not have that, but will just tease a little bit. But maybe they, they will do be active in, in the SFU, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a bit different simulcast. The different because you have three encoders, so remove one encoder is one. Well, you get one three, two or yeah. It so not three. <laughs> you have a number of encoders, so you remove one, so you get some security benefits. You get some uh, uh, bandwidth benefits, and it's always working. Uh, with active in the SDC feature, sometimes it will not work because you, you will not get any benefit. And the only benefit that you get is actually probably a bandwidth reduction, right? Which is good. I'm not, but it, it seems that. Maybe depending on uh, the API, we, we could maybe have something less confusing. But yeah. I don't know. So, so I have to go on, go on to the next slide, I think. Yes. Sure. So there are um, multiple possibilities for those uh, uh, API surface. So the first one is another array of coding parameters that is nested in the RTC, RTP encoding parameters, mm -hmm. which describe a simulcast layer, uh, which is on the next slide. So I hope you can read it from here. No. Um, so we, this is a sequence of special layers. Uh, and the special layers uh, have two parameters, max bitrate and uh, active. Um, that would be just uh, a similar um, 
similar API to some cast layers, but within a special layer. Uh, you, within a sound cast layer. So I suppose we know the mode. Yes. The mode is fixed okay. against um, okay. so opening parameters. So and you, in that case, if we suppose we know the mode, we could have a default. Yes, so that developer wouldn't have to know about that and it would just work by default without putting yes. parameter. Of course. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. name more reason. You cannot do any of these if you don't know the mode because then you don't know the size of the different table yes. and the relationship with the right? So, but but then if you know the mode, you can have a normal default right? that corresponds to the mode and the different ratio on it. Yeah, so it would be similar to the way that some of um Layers are defined in a transceiver. The last parameter that defines all the initial encoding parameters. You could have a values that you set yourself, which would be matched against the load or different special layers. If you don't put anything, default values come. Um, probably by default, there would be active um, flag for each. A year and you cannot resize the array just like you cannot do that for some cast layers. And if you want, you can add the max bitrate uh, value to change a uh, bitrate allocation for your special layer. Uh, very similar to how it works for some cast. So, same question with uh, max bitrate. Um, yes, max bitrate is working very well in some cast because you have three encoders, so you, you need to specify the bitrate for the three encoders. And there you have one encoder mm -hmm. uh, that is doing like this uh, progressive uh, encoding. So I, I mean, I don't exactly know what I, what is the API interface for usual SEC encoders, but I was expecting like yeah, there will be like a, a global back bit rate, and then uh, the allocation will, will be done uh, properly um, for all layers in, in, a, in a yeah. simple way, and it yeah. will be difficult to fine tune or change that. So uh, there, there may be reasons, for example, to allocate more bit rate to the base layer because that will improve everything above it. Well, um, maybe the encoder will, will do it by default. And I, I don't know whether encoders will uh, surface that or whether yeah. currently encoders surface for simulcast because uh, you only need to uh, have some kind of bit rate yeah. But for every layer, I'm not sure that uh, SEC encoders will, will expose that. Well, I know we have that for uh, the X uh, for right. doing div9. Uh, we probably have something similar for uh, Liba Liba one. Liba. Liba. Yes. Um, I'm not certain about that, but I believe that would be something that is implemented. Um, if you don't specify anything, you will have default bitrate allocation, which is probably done already by uh, the higher level. Of yeah, you will have a, a global line, right? And then. Uh, yeah. Up to the encoder to do the distribution between the different. yeah and there it seems like you have a global and then you have local and yes. I guess all of them should if you add them they should match but they may be inconsistent with the other like you might say max so, yeah, yeah so you could say max bitrate one gigabit for special layer when the simulcast layer has maybe only one megabit um, which would probably cap it at one megabit overall. Um, I'm, there, I'm more confused by another aspect of that max bitrate. Yes. If you have the max bitrate is layer one is uh, 200k, the max bitrate for layer two is 400k. Mm -hmm. And now you have congestion on the line so that uh, the total available is 300k. Okay. What will be the uh, distribution of uh, bits between, between the layers? So mm -hmm. You take the ratio, I guess. I mean, the, I mean the, if, if you want the ratio, you should specify the ratio. If you, if you want the absolutes, you want the specific Yeah, I mean, we kind of had this discussion before, Harold, where people were making assumptions that it would, that the congestion algorithm would take that max per rate into account, and we had to basically say, uh, no, it won't. Don't make yeah. that assumption. I mean, it will take it into account in, in some the way, way that it right. will not allocate more for some layer, so you know you will not have more than you know, example, more than 200k for the base layer and 1k, 100k for the second layer. But maybe it will be better to have uh, another a different split, uh, which is up to uh, the user agent to decide what is best. 
to how to allocate 300 kids between two layers that have some sizes. Maybe there's just a tiny bit more uh, once you trade available, and it doesn't make sense to enable the second layer. So that's where the degradation uh, yes. preference should also kick in. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll try to keep all the layers Ouch. active all the time, Ouch. or we'll try we to. Yesterday, um, yeah. we discussed the, the fact that the degradation preference is not clear yesterday. It's going to be worse than the SVC, yeah. 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 So that's uh, one possibility for API. So a subarray in, in the description of each Summercast layer with uh, an active flag that has the default of true and possibly a max betray that is user defined. Uh, the behavior is to be defined for all of that, so spec has to be written, but that would be the general. Uh, Envelope of the API. So, uh, just uh, for time management, you have six minutes. Right. So, so let's move on to the next slide. So, uh, in the next slide, uh, we have something similar, except we also have within the special layer description, uh, including parameters, another array with maybe weights, clothes, that can um, give a weight uh, for each. The bitrate allocation weight for each uh, temporal layer within uh, that special layer, which could be used if you set, would set a weight of zero to deactivate temporal layer. This is uh, something that could be done later on if we move on with proposal one uh, to say uh, later let's add a surface to control temporal layers. Uh, I'm not necessarily fixed on that because use cases for that are very, very uh, expert, and I'm um, not sure if that is something we would use. But uh, there's an example here here for proposal two, which is a bit too small to read, unfortunately, um, which shows how it would look like. Uh, maybe we can try to make it bigger. Yeah. Uh, how it would look like, uh, possibly with temporal weights, uh, but we don't. We can ignore them for now, maybe. Um, it's, it's not clear to me how you would uh, distribute the waste. It's, yeah, but that's something that we, we can uh, ignore for now, probably for uh, time's sake. Uh, so you would have, uh, this is uh, a summon, only one summon cast layer. No no, this is L3, P3, so three spatial, three times. Yes, but no simulcast. No, no, sim no simulcast, yeah. only one out of the stream with a free special layer and uh, each have three temporal layers. And you would have general parameters at the top level and you could have all the parameters for each special layer. Let's ignore the temporal layer weights uh, for now because that could be like an extension of the previous one. Um, and you would just have oh. an array with active max betrayed. So, uh, Bernard, in, in AV1, when you say, when you choose a scalability mode, you already fixed the scale resolution down Right, so this yes. is two to one. So, so this one is two to one. Right, but that means you, it's becoming superfluous. And no, it's like no. kind of confusing since the scalability mode is supposed to have a fixed yeah. yes. resolution. Yes, yes. yes. so exactly. you cannot take another one. So you should not have that scale resolution down That's a different one. Entry. That's uh, scaling down the source. It, before it's uh, piped down to the encoder to be encoded. So if yeah, you have so, so wait, 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 wait. So that's different from that's different from yeah. the same flag with the same name used in simulcast. No, that's simulcast. Right? It's a simulcast exactly flag. That's exactly this one. There's yeah. nothing different. It's so yeah, you might make the point that it's exactly the same thing as applying constraints to the source. Okay. So okay. okay. So let, let, let me rephrase. In the simulcast, so not that API. We have exactly the same flag name used, correct? No, okay. this is this is the this same. Is the yeah. This is the same. Okay. okay. So in the case of the the, the the one we had before before that proposal, uh, that meant that it was giving information to through the signaling between uh, the link be, of, of the three streams that are otherwise independently encoded and independently decodable. Right, mm -hmm. saying the high resolution and the next resolution and the next resolution yeah. are linked by a factor two. Yeah. Do I understand correctly the previous no, yeah. no, it, no, it was yeah. a scaling number between the source and this particular stream. 
So it would be perfectly valid to have three simulcast streams which have a scale resolution down by with two, four, and eight. So it's not the relationship between the streams. It's yeah. a relationship yeah. between the raw media and the, right. and so the so input so. of the... That's, 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 that's at a higher level, is. you can imagine if you have three simulcasts, yeah, yes, it was a yes and no question. Yeah. You know? So it's yes or it's no. No, it, it's not uh, a scaling group. Factor, but uh, it's propagated from all the that soundcast. So it's not between the layers, yeah. it's between a single layer and it's yes. corresponding to a scaled up constraint. Okay, you don't need that. Kind of thing. This is the equivalent of uh, right. basically. Okay, so it's not redundant and it's yeah. separated from the ratio that are implied by the scalability. Right? Exactly. Right. Okay. So if you have a source that is uh, 4K, you scale it down by two, so you have 2K, and then you encode that in SVC with whatever and the uh, ratios that are specified today. Okay, yeah. clear to me. We're out, we're out of time for this. Yeah. Um, what? Are we out of time for this? We are, uh, <coughs> as of your statement, yes. <laughs> yes, your statement made us out of time. So um, I guess what we can do is we're now going to the. There's just one more slide. Oh, okay, so we could do the one Maybe, more slide and then we'll. Um, uh, and the last slide is something that is closer to what was in RTC, and I don't know it that much. Yeah, so um, I'll comment on this. This is basically what was in ORTC, um, and uh, it, the advantage of it is it's very much like the Simulcast API. It uses dependencies um, to basically describe SVC. The, the reason why um, we had a, this was the original proposal for WebRTC the SVC, um, and we went with the scalability mode instead for really two reasons. One was, if, if all you wanted to do was something simple, like have three temporal layers, this created a lot of complexity, um, and it also allowed you to specify a bunch of things that wouldn't make any sense, like uh, trying to have uh, differences in frame, <coughs> frame rate that weren't two to one, and then for temporal scalability, which you really can't do. So there's a, a lot of propensity to, to errors, to complexity for the developer. Um, and also it turned out that there were scalability modes which couldn't be described this way. So it actually had lower functionality and greater complexity at the same time, um, which isn't really a great action. And we already decided the, to use the ENAM. So this, this yeah, the ENAM basically gave us, uh, didn't it, well, aside from the things that uh, Florence has been talking about, um, Basically, gave us most of what we wanted, but significantly simpler uh, for the development. So, basically, I don't think we, given that we rejected this to be with, it probably isn't something to go back to. Uh, but we just wanted to put it out there so people could realize, yeah, um, you know, it is a choice, but probably not. Like so, given the time, we will reallocate um, this today to, to, to the TV shots. Um, yeah, we, we, a little bit more, yeah. Um, I could say that maybe we could flesh out proposal one more to okay. be discussed another time, define more of the behavior of the API, and mm -hmm. so we can discuss it. Uh, well, the idea was to put it this afternoon at 2 p.m., yes. right? 2 p.m. Okay, you have yeah. time enough to yes. get yeah. I, I will see you again. Okay, so um, we're now going to move to the privacy session. Um, can I have another screen for this part? Uh, and yeah, 45 minutes, you went. Okay, so we have all our friends from the Ping Working Group, I guess. Hi. Hello. 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 Nice to meet you. Hello. Um, so we want so we want to go to proposed recommendation, uh, and we want a good horizontal review uh, from you guys. For, for WebRTC. For WebRTC, uh, and get you the media as well. But we also have a bunch of all other creepy specs uh, that you may be interested in as well. Yeah. <gasps> Creepy. What? Potentially creepy. So some some people from the thin working group find the issues, very good issues. So we will start with them, and uh, there are uh, other uh, some other issues that might be interesting to the working group that we added, so that we can discuss it and discuss the potential solution with you. Um, yeah. So let's start with the first one. Uh, Move the energy capacity behind permission. So enumerate devices is used by a lot, a lot of pages uh, on the web. Uh, and the purpose is usually not to go back to the media just after it. And it's probably to um, get valuable fingerprinting information. 
um, typically uh, the number of devices, the number of cameras, the number of microphones, the number of output speaker uh, at any given time. Even just a remark, maybe when introducing a specific API, oh, okay. explain what it is. And so, element devices is a way for a web page to um, enumerate all captured devices, so all available camera, microphone, and output speakers. And then you get a list of, of them with uh, properties like IDs, labels, uh, so that you can basically uh, implement the picker. So the web page is then responsible of uh, implementing the picker so that the user can select a particular camera or a particular microphone. To, to clarify that, the, the ID is origin unique and the labels are abstract until you have questions. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's an only kind of yeah. Yeah. Not that bad. bad. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, uh, where are you all scribing? Uh, on web office here. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, on the IRC channel and web office. Not choosing web office. So, we are all under surveillance. <laughs> Actually, you are. So there's this notion of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. I'm sorry. That, that's actually probably worth saying explicitly. We are recording our meetings. Oh, yeah. Uh, both video and audio. So please be aware of that. Kind of a on us, so <laughs> there should be a green light somewhere. Oh, there's a red. There's a red uh, for hundreds of minutes, I think. Well, so that when there is something that is unclear in the minutes, we can easily go check back what the conversation was. And, and I could also say, because this is a joint meeting, uh, if you'd rather not us regarding this meeting, we can also easily stop this. So, I am fine. Okay. Thank you for your okay. I wish you would warn me when I walked in the door, though. <laughs> you should have that again. Hmm? Yeah, we should, uh, yeah. Online, right? um, so yeah, um, there's the concept of a device info permission, uh, which might be granted or not. If, um, if it's granted, then you have all information. If, if it's not granted, you have some information. So typically you have um, um, labels that are available if the device info permission is granted, and you do not have labels. But you still have uh, a list of devices, the exact list of devices, and device IDs that are persistent. Uh, um, and, and the labels might tell you more about the device, like what kind of microphone it is. Or yeah, to, to do a, a good picker. So if you if you do not have like labels, it's a bit more difficult to to, to do a good picker. Um, so the solution we envision is that since we have this deep device info permission. We, we could rely on it and say, when it's not permitted, we should not have any leak. So we should not have any fingerprinting uh, uh, all when device info permission is not granted. When device info permission is granted, then it's probably fine to expose uh, whatever we whatever want. Device info permission is usually granted when you grant camera access or microphone access full front uh, in most, most implementations. Don't, don't model problem. Oh, it depends. Yeah, model or non-model. It, it really so what I mean is, uh, is the prompt is not controlled by the, by oh, the web page. Yeah, right? it's a prompt that uh, implements the prompt, and it's uh, very should be very big, uh, visible to a user. So this would be it would be for <laughs> changing device after the fact. You couldn't make the initial picture with this because you wouldn't know the device. Yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> right. And so to uh, have a DAC to one, the application should request access beforehand. Yeah. So the point is, uh, we we looked with Safari at uh, most web pages, and all the pictures are actually uh, reachable usually after you grant the user media access anyway. So the proposal would be to to say there are two proposals. The first proposal is to say we expose at most one device of each type. So you still expose the fact that there, there is a camera or not, there is a microphone or not. That, that's all you, you, you actually provide. You do not provide any device ID, you don't provide any more information. That's what uh, Safari is shipping currently. It is web compatible. Um, we ship like for uh, the main Safari since um, 
a few months, like six months at least, and we, we haven't received any uh, bad feedback. So we, we haven't break, broken uh, websites that are supporting Suffer, which does not mean that uh, doing that in Chrome, uh, you never know. But, uh, but, but that's something that, that is good. Um, there's still, in this case, uh, a tiny bit of information. Is there a microphone or a camera um, which is available? And we decided to still expose it for web compatibility. We were not sure whether uh, some website would, would check whether there was a camera or not uh, before coming up to the media. So the proposal to, it to is to say, in any way devices, you expose one device of this type. You're basically lying to the web page saying, yeah, go for it. And then um, you call the um, website will call get to the media. And if there's no device, then there's a promise which is rejected if not find error. So they will discover it with by calling get to the media. But the fact of calling get to the media will usually potentially trigger a prompt. Yeah. And the fact that you trigger a prompt. I, I actually um, let a fingerprint or a script to say, oh no, I will not take the risk to trigger a prompt. Um, because, yeah, it's too, it's too, it's too uh, user, uh, too annoying to, to a user. So only uh, real applications will, will do this kind of case you can be a core anyway. Um, so that's proposal two uh, that we could do, which is stronger and which fixes uh, all. Um, or uh, fingerprinting. We will be fine doing it in Safari, uh, especially if there's consensus. Um, and the third proposal is to put NMM devices behind a prompt, meaning um, there might be either the same prompt as get user media or a different one. Um, we think that it's difficult to implement if it's a different prompt than get user media because you, you need to provide a uh, message to the user which is meaningful. That's tough. And uh, we are not sure about uh, the shipping, first, like shipping that without a uh, big user impact is also difficult. Like you ship that oh, and you see a lot of prompts in New York Times. And, uh, oh my God. So, yeah. So that, that's the thing there. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm sorry, Rob. Uh, is the New York Times actually called this API? Um, we, we know that. It's, it's like a lot of pages are calling anyway devices. Yeah. Yeah. For what purpose? Finger. So yeah. if you look at the stats for how often the right device is called versus getting user media, it's about an order of magnitude more frequent. Gotcha. So any sites that don't ever prompt for the camera and microphone do it in those devices. We know it's a big issue. But yeah. is there any valid use case of using this function before you have the permissions granted by get user media considering you can't you can't do a figure. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. The, yes. Uh, the browser is you can, sorry. If you finish your question because you can't do a picker. <coughs> well you can't do a picker, but you can remember from, from if, if you look at the uh, typical hangouts chat mode, you will see in the top corner a uh, phone icon and a camera icon. If you don't have a camera, the camera icon will not be there. This is a typical example of UI that uh, is depending on proposal one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it will work in proposal one, but it will not work in proposal two. Um, it will. In, well, you will have access. Like in, in, so, yes. in the typical yes. hangout case, it will work because hangout is uh, requesting permission very early. Yes, can't use anything well, If, it, if you're you using the chat mode in hangout. Oh. Because yeah. hangout also has uh, yeah, right. chat functionality that doesn't require mm -hmm. people to buy into the, all this media stuff. And Hangouts could ask for and yeah, learn about your media, right? So Hangouts could uh, yeah. the ask for a microphone uh, when when people don't don't expect it to, to because people use Hangouts just for chat. Yeah. So in that case, if we go with proposal two, Hangouts would need to say, okay, I'm putting the icons, and when the user is clicking, they will know there's an issue, and they will say, hey, please. Plug in your camera, please plug in your microphone. That's the kind of uh, UI that they would uh, need to implement, which is, um, yes. Do you, do you want the user before they try to make a call or after they try to make a call? I don't think it's. Or do, you, uh, or do you expose the functionality that the user won't be able to the user, okay. or do you remove it before you um, uh, remove it because you know that the user doesn't 
I'm thinking about that. We need cumin edmund and if you can take okay. care of this. Right. Okay. No, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily saying on IRC, but we need someone to make sure people get started. Okay. Uh, go ahead. What is the device ID? Is yes. it all free form string? Uh, we'll talk about this later on. But it's uh, basically it's uh, UUID. Ooh, okay. so but but it's, it's, or, uh, it's origin unique, so uh, different origins. Okay, yeah. and we will so talk about this. Right but that's the issue related to finger uh, printing by device IDs. Yeah. So, so it's, it is different for origin. So you're, you're double keyed. Yes, yes. in Safari, yes. yes. But oh, not, but the, the stack does not require it. No, no, no. And okay. we'll talk about this issue later. The, the second slide, please. On next slide. I'll wait. So one. Maybe minor issue with proposal two is what if we add new device capture type like smell vision comes in? Uh, uh, depth is already in the pattern. So if you expose one of each type, then it really becomes very useless information. I mean, and of uh, course, that means something I, because personally, I think that we did it many devices, and for new type of devices, maybe we should have pick uh, kind of things. And, um, and then, yeah. So from our perspective, I thought yesterday we did um, uh, the proposal one sounds absolutely reasonable. It basically solves the problem because even so, trying to, even if you know that a user has uh, only a camera or a microphone, doesn't really help you understand if it's always the same user. Uh, so proposal one sounds good. The proposal two, which is exactly one device per time. Sounds uh, basically like the API's line about what the device oh, has. On, on the device, on the device has. Could, be, could be that as well, right? So at least it's empty. Yeah, right. But it's uh, the, the way the proposal is written here is exactly one device per Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that that would be like sort of line about the availability of the of devices. It doesn't. It's just like get to the media when it's being made and. Right. And that information is basically yeah. Yeah. okay. So, so what we implement in Safari is uh, we return the number of cameras and microphones that is that are by default included in that in the class of device. So, for an iPhone, there are two cameras and a microphone or laptop there. One and one. If the device has extra um, attached after the user has been granted permission to use the camera, we fire the device change event as though uh, cameras and or microphones were attached, attached at that point, no. and the uh, uh, interface device then includes the other devices. But, but um, your third, uh, third option there is very appealing. Uh, I mean, I think there should be a hard line between website being able to learn about the hardware on the device. Um, I understand that there's a web compat problem there. Is there any option to choose one in the short term, throw up all sorts of errors in the console or whatever, and move to three in the long term? So, in, in terms of uh, permission, there's the device info permission. So, you could always. Uh, an implementation is free to to implement the prompt uh, to actually uh, put the item for permission. I mean, I guess I don't mean what's technically feasible. I mean, I'm wondering what the oh, in terms of implementation. Or what the no, I, I guess I'm wondering what people at the table might be feeling. How would you ask a meeting for how, how what kind of question could you ask the user that would make sense? Is it okay for this page to know that you have covered like that seems like a great question, yeah. And also, so, it, it kind of defeats so the purpose. Actually, uh, I, I have a direction to go with that, um, which is one of the anti patterns that we identified in the commission workshop was jumping on users as soon as they arrive. And one bad behavior I've seen out of WebRTC apps is insisting on getting permissions in order to start, particularly insisting on getting camera permission, even if they then let you turn it off later. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything we can put in here to say, actually, start up with, you need to be prepared if you start up with nothing and incrementally add. Yeah, so I'd actually like to comment on that because 
part of the reason this happens is because progressively we've been removing more and more functionality if you don't ask for permission. Um, and, and what you had is a great example because pre previously there were many university apps that did not ask for permission when viewing a class if you weren't asking a question. Because why do I need your camera and microphone? You're just listening to the professor. There's no reason, right? And also it's considered a little creepy because why would I ask for your permission? You know, is the professor watching me? Why is he even asking me for this? Yeah. I'm just trying to listen to the guy, what the hell it is, right? So, but the problem that resulted from that is, is they then, um, uh, it, we actually with something called MDNS, if you didn't ask for permission, we assumed you were trying you were trying to potentially get at somebody's IP address and know all kinds of stuff about them. So we actually made it so that all of your traffic had to go through a relay server, which actually caused all kinds of problems with these university apps and overloaded them. So instead of just talking all over the campus network, they had to go through a server. And then these apps started asking for the permission because that's the only way they could really function. So there's, there actually is blowback from some of this privacy stuff in that um, and that it actually changes behavior and can cause some of the things that you think are even worse. Uh, so. so I want to go back to the uh, permission prompt on the Android devices. I doubt any browser would actually prompt the user because yeah. it's uh, very complicated to explain. And number two, the only remaining use case that Harold mentioned was to show a, a camera icon or a microphone icon. And the only purpose of that, I think, is to inform the user whether uh, they have the ability uh, to prompt, you know, you want to show them before you prompt. So if you're going to prompt to figure out if you if you can prompt them, that, that's kind of redundant. Right? So I think browsers would rather not give that information at all or, or lie about it than yeah. try to prompt. Or one yes. Basically, there's no other need to enumerate devices ahead of asking the user if they want to. In, in, the, in, in, in the interest of time, we have spent 20 minutes on this uh, slide. Yes. So okay. I, I would want to summarize that proposal, proposal one seems to be uncontroversial. Proposal two might be slightly better. But uh, shall we? Shall we? Uh, Bernard, you, you, share, you share this. Uh, shall we, shall we uh, draw, draw a question and move on? Or shall yes, we? Yes, sure. <laughs> I just want to say it's not uncontroversial. I think websites should not be able to learn about the no. hardware capabilities. No, it's a, it's uncontroversial since from the implementers. Nobody really objects to implementing version one. Yes. So that would be again meaning current, the current currently the current Chrome and Firefox uh, allow a huge figure printing, <coughs> and proposal one will reduce it a lot. Are the chairs dismissing the feedback they're receiving from outside contributors? Uh, no, that's not making, you're making the chairs are asking, asking you to contribute feedback to all the issues within the 45 minutes you, we, we have. So, uh, <laughs> and clear, just to be clear, each of these proposals is a net improvement right. on top of what we have today shipping. Uh, and, I, and I hear your feedback, but I'm not at all, and I'm not a chair, but I'm not dismissing it at all. What we are discussing is what kind of improvements over the current situation can be made controversially or not. Really doing the first uh, first improvement, which I hear you say is not a sufficient improvement, uh, is uncontroversial. So no matter what, we could already do this and make the situation less bad than it is today. So proposal, yeah, I think we can record that. But question to at least do proposal one. There is some interest to do proposal two or wrong. Proposal two is uh, equivalent to uh, something. Feel free to reschedule this. I, I think there's some confusion here. Um, yeah. A proposal, uh, these are incrementally more uh, privacy. They're incremental. So proposal one is good, proposal two is better, proposal three is best. But they're not mutually exclusive. I think all people were saying was that uh, we're happy to implement uh, at least go to step one, and then we can talk about going further. Does that make sense? I mean, we're not makes, trying to dismiss any of the privacy concerns every week. I mean, it makes sense to me that I understand what you're saying. Uh, I'm Firefox, I, I very much want to support making this more private, and I feel there's some confusion here about uh, the intent behind people's statements. And we really want to support this. I mean, I can't speak for anybody else. I imagine Sam is frustrated because uh, 
there is a well understood boundary that websites should not understand and not be able to query for hardware device capabilities. <laughs> what I hear from this organization, what this, this group is saying, well, no, 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 it's proposal two, it's, it's fixing its concern. Yeah, I don't think that's correct. Proposal two, you call anyone that you have no, no information. Right. Uh, uh, you you just basically get a default profile on any device. You have any no information at all. So you basically always know that there it's, is it's, it's one it's camera, one, one microphone, ever, even though if that's not the case. Yeah. Even if there are no. So it's a lot. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not lying about what they must do. It does not break existing stuff. Understood. So then when do I get the true, correct information? When he just gets the media advantage. So the user gets a prompt, gets right. a prompt saying, oh, you want to get access to camera or not? Exactly. If the user will say yes. And then any more devices will provide the true All the information. Yeah. Okay. So information access is protected by. Uh, I, 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 I just want to make sure I'm understanding that mm -hmm. correctly. I, I apologize for the slowness of learning. Let me repeat it back to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Um, so under proposal two, um, the website says basically I can do the, the hardware can do everything, and then it only narrows that down once the wish is corrected. Right. Exactly. So it either expands or narrows depending on what's actually on the chain. So if if your Browsing from a device that has neither a camera nor a microphone, it would look as though there was one camera and one microphone. You could try to request them, you would get an error. I see. Okay. If if I if you're on this machine as it is now, there's one camera and one microphone, or with extras, it would say there's one camera and one microphone. And after the user is so then you can call it user media. The, the user could say no, in which case there's no other, it still looks like there's one. Or the user could give access to it, at which point, if there are, if there are other devices, you get an event that said a device has been attached, um, and then that list would include all. So that sounds very appealing. I, I, I don't mean to take it this time uh, further. I just want to make sure I truly understand the proposal of the suggestion. Um, if I'm on a device that does not have a, a camera, yeah. under proposal two, it would say I do have a camera. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. So I'm yes. able to uh, access uh, your request, yeah. access to, to the user. So that sounds, yeah, that does sound very appealing. Um, mm -hmm. Can you say um, which is why is proposal one so on table? So proposal one is what is a for sure web content compatible and safari is shipping this approach. So we, we know we can implement it and we know we can at least go back. For proposal two, the issue is that it might write some websites that have this UI where uh, they, they put like this camera icon somewhere, you click sure. on it, and they, they would like to dismiss it, to not show it <coughs> if it's not available. Sure. And that's that's where we are like yeah, it's like uh, two bits of information that um, uh, websites can query. Uh, in fact, in practice, for iPhones or a lot of uh, devices from us, for, from Apple, it's not a big issue, but sure. still it's a potential issue. Sure. So, Although, from the perspective of a script, it would be the same as if there was a camera on the device the user clicks on it, and the user does not, grant per, does not grant permission. So the UI, in that case, would, on this device, show a camera icon, a microphone icon, but it wouldn't be able, you know, the, the, yeah. the page wouldn't function. So right. it's the same either case. So from, I mean, it's not a loss functionality. No, it's just a UI optimization that that yes, yeah. potentially that we remove from the web developers. Sure. I mean, the proposal two sounds very appealing. Um, I think that would be good. Yeah, I, that fits in. Do you uh, want to get an overview of all the, all the privacy issues, or do we want to yeah. focus on this issue? For okay, so can we recall that at least for implementers, there's uh, consensus to back it go to proposal one, and we need to discuss whether to go to proposal two? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And that team would like proposal two. Yes. I'm a supporter of proposal one and proposal two. I, I think I'd like to discuss it more, but I think it's not fine. Like, it's, it's not super controversial. Okay. I, I find proposal two appealing. 
Okay, yeah. good. Plus one on purple too. So yeah, okay. Okay. It well, protects okay. privacy yeah. better than one. Okay. Sounds very good. Yeah, that's good. I, I am I am not not happy, but I, I accept that I'm in the minority of this. Well, I, I okay. think we're just getting a feeling at this point. Uh, and there is no specific proposal that we could have. That's not clear right now. Okay. Um, so another issue, uh, six or seven, that was uh, raised by, uh, by Peter. Uh, it has um, device IDs are persistent. Uh, so potentially they can be used to do cross site tracking. Uh, by third party iframes. Uh, we have some mitigations currently. Uh, device IDs are cleared whenever there's any of your person data and it could be that are cleared. Um, device IDs by default are not exposed to cross origin iframes because when uh, you uh, third party iframe need to be authorized by the top uh, page to get access to camera and microphone. So by default, uh, if the top level page is not delegating access, potential access to camera and microphone in my device is open uh, an entry. And also, device IDs are not exposed uh, if what I have is not writing device ID programmation uh, based on the feeling from a previous issue. So, the current solution would be to patch on device IDs as done for cross system data, meaning that, next slide. Um, the proposal is to say that implementation must partition device IDs if other data is also partitioned. Um, that's the proposal. Add a note for future spec versions that we will require device ID partition. And or if, yeah, implementation should partition device IDs. So the, the point of why non mandating partitioning to all user agents now, uh, first, it's difficult to shift because Device ID will usually be stored in ID, in the TV. So if you have like different IDs that are stored in the same database, if you're not partitioning ID, then uh, you may have some conflicts uh, from different iframes. So it might confuse web applications. And anyway, if you're not partitioning index DB, uh, partitioning device IDs is uh, is not helping helping you as either. Like web application can put like um, Local storage identifiers, uh, and this will be shared. Right, right. Yeah. Can you explain the word partition? Yeah. So yeah. partition is the I, guess, I discussed this uh, some some it, it, yeah. it turned out that I had not understood the word, and therefore oh, I didn't okay. understand. It. So, for so in Safari for index DB service worker, uh, all these things, uh, if you have top level page A origin A and iframe origin B, then uh, of course, these two have, um, have a separated storage per origin. But iframe B, uh, its origin is not only really B. Its, its origin is A slash B. So that if you have another iframe of origin B in a top level page of origin C. Uh, no, you're, not, you're not saying origin. You're, take, you're, you're, you're saying that the lookup key is A plus B. Yeah, the lookup key is, yeah. Region. If you have two iframes from B, Inside page A, yeah. will they have the same? Uh, yes. Are you describing device ID now? No, no, no. I'm describing the same thing. Okay, I'll do it. No, no, no. no, no. no, no. no, no. And so, for reference, is there any existing standard documentation or specification of this double claim mechanism? Um, I know that um, there will be, there is work on going to try to define that for um, the HTTP cache. And there's great work, there's interest in uh, specifying something for service workers as well. So when you say in the HTTP cache in what group? Uh, that's a good discussion. I guess it will be uh, in, fetch, in fetch spec at some point. What about cookies? Cookies is a very different technology. You cannot ship uh, the webkin team for cookies, but you can block cookies. And that's what uh, basically Safari is. Got it. Um, yeah, exactly. The work is done. So currently, we, we cannot rely on uh, the concept of the data king anywhere. So we, we need to define it. Uh, I'm not sure it's device IDs, but, but this spec that should define it. It should be like a global concept uh, that the HTML spec is defining. And then we would say, OK, we take this key, which is defining HTML spec, and we 
fashion based on this. Uh, that would be great because this way we would not need to define a reservation team that is different for the different uh, type of question data. So we have oh, okay. So I, I, I wonder if you could um, uh, get to the meat of the issue by saying, I think we all agree, or my concern is not what happens where uh, you're in a browser where there's double keying. It's what happens, what does the standard say with this? You're in a browser where there's not double keying. So, so, so uh, the end goal is to double click for all browsers to go to double clicking, I hope. Sure, totally. And uh, currently, uh, if you double K key device IDs but not over data, it's, uh, it's very difficult to ship. Uh, I couldn't say what's difficult to ship. That is, to be honest, not my concern. Um, but it, as a straw man proposal, it doesn't seem particularly difficult. Uh, my understanding is that all, those, all the shipping versions of device IDs basically have a seed. That seed feeds the device IDs, and that seed is thrown away every time. Storage is cleared, or whatever the whatever the meaning due by side these actions. It seems like it would not be very difficult to feed into that seed the two origins. Yeah, I mean, we, we we want to go there. But I mean, it doesn't even seem like it requires the rest of the machinery. Uh, for uh, the I, I guess what uh, Peter is saying is that even if we don't get data partitioning, we can enforce the data partitioning by saying that if you are in a say on an iframe, then the seed that you use to you to generate the UID is based on the two origins rather than one, and, and, and that's not a full protection because it could be stored as well as you were saying, but that's still much better because you get that behavior by default. Yeah, this partition of the ID space, not yes. the storage space. We actually have the no, that no, we have double keying for permission content. We stopped doing that. I, I think what you were trying to say though is uh, uh, the purpose of the um, enumerated devices was that. Uh, if you go to Hangouts, for instance, a user has multiple microphones and cameras, then Hangouts was supposed to be able to manage what what the user, which camera the user used last time, and, and stuff like that. So and, um, the, the double keying, so that they could use it, they could take the device ID from last time and they could store it like an index DB. Mm -hmm. uh, next time, they if they come in a different setting, I guess. Uh, They'll already be able to, if they start out in IndexedDB, they'll already have that ID. So, what privacy benefit was there of, but if they not call enumerated devices again, it's not going to be usable, but they still have a tracking ID. So, it sounds like we're saying, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we want to go to be more private when an index of DB goes more private. But it doesn't make it doesn't really add any value until index DB is also partitioned. So I think there's two issues here. One is that the idea of a device ID being a, a persistent unique identifier is a bad privacy choice from the get go. It's orange and unique, yes. It's, just, it's not like a global ID. It's, it's a, it, I mean, it, it's a global ID in that the browser will no other browser in the world will present this. It, it, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that's another issue that we have right now. Yeah. That right. No, I mean, it's a separate issue we'll discuss on not using UID. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's their proposal of using one, two, three, four, for instance. Okay, yeah. because I think that's another, I mean, I personally actually strongly agree with you that you made a mistake there, but. Uh, so, so the, the, you're right. So, first on device IDs is to reuse um, when you go to the same page again and again, the same device. It's true that there could have been a design where the user agent would have. Uh, store the last device that you will use, and you will get to the media audio through and get exactly the same device as before. We, we could have done. Uh, that's that would have been great. Uh, now we are there. We're thinking that um, web applications are using it. Double clicking is solving the, the privacy issue. So for most, I mean, just to point back, most browsers don't share double clicking. Right, just as an objective state in the world. So, so, keying, so making your privacy guarantees against the thing that most browsers are not doing is not a useful privacy benefit. So, you would like a must, uh, yes. must function device ID instead of should in, in the exactly. current yes. proposal. Okay, Absolutely. yeah. Can we record that in? Uh, so, what is it we record that? Ping once a month, or is that we're doing that? Um, that ping wants that, and um, I'm fine with it. Yeah. 
must partition device at least if other data is partitioned. No, 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 must. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm, fine, I'm fine with it. Um, I don't know what you're thinking about, but that's. Well, I mean, I think given the time constraint, yeah. we should record uh, okay. some good yeah. thing. I mean, I'm hearing some yeah. level of support from the okay. but maybe um, others also need to. Ne go. Next slide. Uh, okay. okay. I, 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 I'm, 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 but I mean, I, I do think that the choice to have a unique identifier for privacy is, is a point, is a privacy harming choice. So, whenever there is a point where there's functionality change that or fire, any site wants to get advantage of that functionality change to re architect their site, I think there would be a chance, a, yeah. a extremely good point to reconsider that choice. So, so uh, there's a proposal for output speakers, and with that, we, we could change. Person's ID because it would be a new API, so it, it could, we might be able to do some things there. And okay. so, yeah, just for my understanding, if with double keying, is the UID still problematic for other reasons? Yeah, I mean, it's less problematic, but it still it still has the exact same property. Okay, I'll read the. Yeah. I would just go on. Next slide. Okay, so uh, so it, so WebRTC stats um, is exposing. For developing purposes, the network type of the user. So you can know, you can learn using WebRTC whether a user is on Wi-Fi, Ethernet, VPN, uh, WiMAX, blah, blah, blah. The main use case there is to uh, do bad connection analytics and identify, identify root causes of network issues. I believe it's not for trying to optimize like the connection or whatever. It's the main purpose. The problem is that it's increasing the fingerprinting space. It's, uh, it's a privacy issue. It can still be misused to try optimizing the service based on this information. You could, you could say, oh, I will do a quick peer connection, get the network type, and then uh, load with MSC uh, based on this information process. And um, the third thing is that, the third problem is that the user does not need to provide this information to get uh, the exact same service as if it, if it was not providing this information. So there are a few proposals. Uh, proposal A is to move this stack within an extension spec. Uh, this does not require any change to existing implementations, uh, but it would not be mandatory to implement and support. And uh, we could add guidance about when this stack field will be generated in this extension spec. And if we find a good model, then we might agree, for instance, in Safari to implement it. I'm not sure. Um, proposal B is to say, yeah, there's already a fingerprint in node. So we, we're good. That's the current status. So we close this issue without action, basically. Uh, proposal C is to say that there's this unknown uh, value that is available. And uh, we add specific guidance to not provide that, that information by default. And maybe if that user media permission is granted, then we would allow uh, to expose the network type. Um, my personal preference is to go with proposal A. Basically. Uh, I'm not sure I understand this correctly. So, what exactly is the service, fingerprint service? Um, well, you, you know that this user. Uh, is, is using Wi Fi or Ethernet so, or VPN. <laughs> so it's a privacy issue. But more importantly, you know this user has been using Wi Fi and Ethernet and VPN. And at that time, so you can identify patterns and. Uh, oh, yeah. So. I don't know. I think it's, it's, fun, it's fundamental to know programming the vendors might do different trade for Wi Fi or. So WebRTC is allowing you to. Um, to handle different bandwidth. And we think that Wi-Fi Ethernet and VPN information is not useful for, for, for really that. It's more useful for what I heard from people to uh, <coughs> analysis uh, of when the connection is bad and identify connection issues. So, so there is a use case, right? If I'm on, uh, I'm on my cellular and I don't want to use it because I'm in Japan and it's very expensive, then I might tell, my, tell the app to prefer Wi-Fi over Right. So, but if I'm at home, where so I have to, be, to be clear, that's not what this is about. That's the network information API in type of use case. This is really specifically about statistics you get out of WebRTC usage, which are specifically not meant 
or adapting the user experience. Exactly. They're, they're meant to debug and monitor the service. Yeah. The use case there is an analysis. Like you get stats to identify issues. Okay. So it's and after the fact you're saying, oh, all these connections are under Wi-Fi, oh, or on the VPN. So we might collect we might we might identify that IP addresses and so on and go to Yes. Retrospective analysis on yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not the net info. Okay. So it's not uh, required for by the website, basically. So proposal A is to move it from the main side. Yeah. I just want to, to raise that um, there is uh, a subset of the recording providers. Uh, another API called the network event, uh, network event log, uh, any help? Network error logging? No error log, sorry, yeah, that's example for this. Um, but it, is, it is a way of gathering this advice and this information. I think that information <coughs> not, should not be available by default to websites, mm -hmm. which should require some user gestures and user signal opt in. But if a website wants to get this information, there's another way of getting it. Okay. So we just, as a, so, so you think we could. We, um, so, so it's net network error logging doesn't provide information about the type of network, does it? Uh, I, well, I, I mean, it provides a lot of information. I know they provide that. You may, you may be more familiar than I do, but I thought it helps. It would tell you DMS errors, um, the type of connection. How, so, I, 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 uh, if you're skeptical about it, then I'm, I feel all the same. I mean, I, so, and maybe just to put some framing context on this. So, th there is the network information API, which provides information to any website on which type of network, what kind of bandwidth and latency, with some fuzzing uh, that is available, I think, today only in Chrome, maybe in all version of Firefox. Uh, and the network type that is reported is very similar, although not exactly the same as the one that is reported by WebRTC. So then there is this network error logging spec, which I think is now a draft of the Web Performance Working Group which basically provide an HTTP endpoint when, where you can report when anything went wrong when trying to fetch a resource, and it comes with some level of data it may have network data. Is it permission based? Uh, no, it's not. It should be, but it's not. It's okay. not so, yet. Maybe. <laughs> so there could be a proposal A, which is move this stack as an extension stack, and then base exposure of this stack based on the uh, permission. Yeah, I, I mean, if I'm saying, I don't really mean it. There is a API for gathering network information. This could be moved there. Well, the, the good thing about the, the thing about stats there is that it's fairly uh, nice. Websites are using it, so um, exposing or not based on the permission seems perfectly fine. And to be clear, you want proposal C. Um, is to only expose the, in, the information after the user has granted permission to use the camera or the microphone. But it's a bit so. In yeah. that way, it is permission based. Uh, no. yeah. Yeah. It, it is a weird permission, but also again for context, for good or bad reasons, this is already a weird permission because we grant specific not network knowledge when you get that permission. Right. We already do that for other privacy reasons. But we should not. Continue. I mean, I'm just saying that there is a precedent. It's maybe such a bad precedent we should continue. <laughs> <laughs> it's not any weirder. So it might cause people the websites to ask for camera permission where they don't really need it yeah. because for the sake so of benefit. If there's a plan for a specific nice permission for this kind of data, uh, this workload should be the best. So also maybe for context, full shipping network type and web RTC stuff to the Chrome and Edge, Firefox, you have yeah. 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 Um, time check. Well, time check is basically. Then can we get uh, some um, rough understanding of uh, we, we ship that consensus? Well, is there any consensus there between uh, right. within the room or within implementers? So, uh, just uh, proposal A and B are no changes to actual. No, are no changes. I don't like proposal A just because. Uh, Yes. Nobody will find that extension space. Right, right. They will see the stat and they will say, what? Well, okay. I, I, I yeah. like to have stats in a stat spec. But, I, I, uh, but, but the, the, the C is the more important one. I mean, right. the guidance about when should you expose those. Uh, 
Um, I think we should give guidance on when to expose it or consider uh, removing it if it's not. So, yeah. yeah, proposal C would be basically uh, we define a new permission to get that data, and then in WebSC stat, we say if the permission is granted, expose it, if not, not. So, I mean, I think <coughs> when I can, we see, already have some thing in the spec where we call correctly about network type where we say you know, use unknown if you don't want to reveal the, the reality. Um, I mean, I think there is like a, a practical question and a theoretical question. The practical question is, um, does splitting the thing out gives us more room, more time for defining the guidance and so on? And there is a theoretical question, which is, how do we define these mitigations? What are the right mitigations? And I think permission from or permission gating, let's say, uh, might be one of these mitigations, but there may be other projects. So I, I personally think, in general, putting more effort into the mitigation space sounds good. Whether it is linked to a specific permission, I'm still unsure because I, I don't have the model on when that permission will be granted in practice. The question on would anonymizing and saying network one, network two, network three, specifying which one's which, would that and being consistent, consist like always starting with one, two, three, would that make it less of a privacy issue? Mm, no, it, it's, it's if you for analysis purposes, you really need to know whether it's uh, Wi Fi or uh, for analysis. And I want to say that the call is experiencing difficulties when it's it looks like it's switching between two networks repeatedly, right? That's something that I can gain without knowing which network it is on. So there might be added benefit for understanding when we're switching networks if, if I'm not hurting the privacy. Okay. Yeah. So, any feedback on that? Yeah, just a couple thoughts. Um, one, one is that people using or who are using VPNs are usually doing so because they want a privacy guarantee. So, the idea of reporting when somebody's using a VPN seems like a particularly not privacy respecting okay. choice. Yeah. Um, two is that if, you're, if your goal is to get information about switching networks, then you want to, if that is a necessary thing that must be reported, the thing to report is that I am switching networks, not the type of network I'm switching between. Um, and three is that uh, I just I think that the idea of providing guidance in specs is is uh, not particularly useful, and, and, and that you all have the expertise in the room of what the, the best option is and what the best trade offs are, and so you want to decide what the best trade off is, and not to say here is a suggestion that people should do what they will do. So you're suggesting that instead of guidance, we should judge rules. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you want to have mandatory text. Uh, I just want to say that um, having analyzed this data, VPN isn't particularly useful information to know because it could that basically be traveling over any network. So who the hell, yeah. what the hell difference does it make anyway? Um, um, and it's it really what you're trying to provide usually is assistance to the like a company that's to know that their Wi-Fi is messed up or something. And the fact that the guy was on the VPN could be in a coffee shop and has nothing to do with their corporate network anyway, so it doesn't provide any useful information. So whatever I found. I found that the idea was messed up, it was like useless. So, so I think that there may be something here to investigate that. Like what actual network information type is useful for control of this type? Um, Can I just add, just, just to be clear, in some countries it's illegal to use VPNs. Right. So broadcasting that, not a good thing. So VPN, so it's clear that VPN is a bad value for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah, that's, uh, well, uh, and we sh so we should just delete that. Yeah. I mean, if you can't tell what the immediate, uh, yeah. is a network diagnostic help, helper for, yeah. I mean, most people who are on wired networks have, okay, most people who are on, uh, on uh, 3G and so on are, have problems that that's uh, what pe what people are using this for. Whether that's good enough to keep it, I don't know. I just checked the network error information. Er network er error logging thing does not you provide you network information. It's not error. There are other metrics that will give you stuff like like hit rates and, and packets lost and like so you can you can already identify I'm on a bad network. Uh, this seems like a heuristic. Like oh, if I'm on Wi-Fi, maybe I have a bad network. But I mean, if you can. Figure, figure out the quality of your network by, by other means. Do you, do you need to know 
Well, Wi-Fi is just one half. Like, so you have Wi-Fi. Yeah, and we, what do you have? You have, have four G, or you have Ethernet, or you have, and you, you, we are not reporting that. Yeah. So I'm not convinced of its use. So we don't have Varun on the call because he would be a complete consumer of that information. Yeah, he would be the only one consumer. The proposal B is to remove the remove the stats. Also remove the stats. I D. A proposal D remove the stats. Yeah. And so when you move a stat to an extent spec, it means uh, yeah, you remove it from the main spec, which is yeah. I mean, I think it's. So if we have a spec, it means we think this is something that should be implemented, okay. Um, okay. not something that we don't want you to. Okay. So we should mention proposal D. I I think that on our side we would be fine with proposal D. So can we record that we either want to clarify when to report unknown or to remove it? Um, well, I would guess that if permission is not granted, you do not even expose it. You do not expose it. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you would have to would have the property dynamically. Yeah, it's a Yeah, oh, it's a okay. So sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. So what, what is the, the thing, opinion? Both options, remove it or date it by permission is fine, or do you have a preference? I mean, if I'm, if I'm reading the group right, it seems that the group is saying it's not very useful, so why have it? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I will. Portion that by, by the fact that the editor of that spec isn't with us today, uh, and in particular, the services he provides for debugging WebRTC connections uh, is like one of the most popular out there, and he would have lots of knowledge on how useful it is. He will probably have a bit less. Of that. So, awesome. so if it makes sense to remove it, more information, then that probably makes sense. Otherwise, gating it. Gating is better than not gating. Yeah. If you can remove it, that's even better. So, okay. so we definitely want to make rules, and one possible rule is never, which is remove <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, we won't have time probably for the last issue, I guess. Right. Um, but just to say that, um, just to explain a little bit. So, uh, for output speakers, um, currently there's no way to select one. Uh, you can select one if you can get to the media access, and right. you can use any devices to. Create a picture for output speakers. Uh, we think it's not sufficient for all use cases, and we think that maybe we should use a, a picture based uh, UI. Meaning, I want to request something, and then you, based on the whether your user is selecting one device or cancelling, you, you request something. We think we should go there. And uh, we, we want to make a proposal uh, there. And we think it's solving more cases, it's more privacy. Uh, uh, it has some privacy benefits, so I don't know if you're, you're uh, uncomfortable with that approach. Well, when you, yes, I'm not very familiar with this. Sorry, I should figure out how to You're suggesting an in Chrome picker with the browser yeah. that asks yeah. the page. Yeah. yeah. This is, and they, without having read it close to this, it's very good. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. We, I don't know if you have interest there. Yes. The only thing that we might want to look into more in detail is this constraint stuff. Do we yeah. want that or not? Well, that's a different, okay. different okay. discussion. So okay, so we per se, the API is good. Okay, we'll, we'll proceed with coming with a proposal. If you're interested, uh, yeah. feel free to help. Yeah. Cool. Okay, um, so I think we went a bit of a time. Yes, Peter? I, I just want to say uh, I seem very stern ahead of it. Pretty nasty headache, but I'm very grateful for your time and it's, it's very useful. I think. We so, really uh, value your feedback. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. It's also for great. Uh, and uh, we apologize for uh, not only doing bad time management, but being uh, un unnecessarily harsh when we <laughs> discovered that we were doing bad. Yeah, I mean, just take care. Of we'll do yes. better. And we look forward to more conversations. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we are now at ten o'clock, and we have a scheduled break till ten thirty. Okay. Which I think we probably need. And we are not at ten o'clock. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd like to be back at ten thirty. No. no. <laughs> we don't want to be back at ten thirty. We want to be back when ten thirty-five. Yes. Okay. Yeah.
Hasta luego, Lina.